your job has got to be persuading people to come to your cause, persuading them to pressure politicians, persuading the politicians to take it more seriously. And I think we sometimes underestimate the agency that we do have because we see so often how that agency isn't exercised and doesn't succeed. But just because it doesn't succeed every time doesn't mean that it can't succeed where it really matters. How do we get people like you to join the campaign? Hello and welcome to Planet Critical, the podcast for a world in crisis. My name is Rachel Donald. I'm a climate corruption journalist and your host. Every week I interview experts who are battling to save our planet. My guests are scientists, politicians, academics, journalists and activists. They explain the complexities of the energy, economic, political and cultural crises we face today, revealing what's really going on and what they think needs to be done. These are the stories of the big picture. Go to planetcritical.com to learn more and subscribe. My guest this week is Alistair Campbell. Alistair is a former journalist who became a strategist and spokesman for Tony Blair and the New Labour government in the late 90s. Since leaving politics, Alistair remains a strategist, has become a mental health campaigner, and is the author of multiple books, including his latest, But What Can I Do? A passionate tirade about what's gone wrong in politics how to wrestle power back with effective campaigns and highlighting the agency that we do have in politics, even when we don't feel like it. Alongside all of this, Alistair also co-hosts the UK's number one podcast, The Rest is Politics. He joined me to discuss how to run a campaign. We talked about the polarisation in society, how to get two different sides to listen to one another. We talked about the strategies that campaigners can deploy the importance of a campaign mindset, the progress that is being made around the world, and the urgency of campaigning when that progress still isn't enough. We talked about the problem with power, the relationship between populace and politics, when people's agency is diminishing in an increasingly inequitable world. He talked about the importance of getting real politic on side, on understanding how to speak to the people in power and bring them into your understanding of the world. And he finishes up by making a surprising and welcome promise. I hope you all enjoy the episode. If you do, please share it far and wide. And if you're loving the show, become a patron on Patreon or support Planet Critical with a paid subscription at planetcritical.com. By signing up, you'll get the Planet Critical newsletter inspired by each episode delivered straight to your inbox every week. You'll also have access to the wonderful Planet Critical community who are full of inspiring thoughts, ideas, critiques, and determination. The links are in the description box below. I'm so grateful to everyone who chooses to support the project. I'm a vehement believer in ad-free and open access content, so Planet Critical wouldn't exist without the direct support of the amazing community. Thank you so much to all of you who believe in Planet Critical and keep the project going every week. Alistair, thank you very much for joining me on Planet Critical. It is a real pleasure and honour to have you on the show. Thank you very much. I'm glad to be here. So, first question. uh, Why is the world in crisis and what can we do about it? Can you start with a nice, easy question first? (laughs) Um, Why is the world in crisis and what can we do about it? Um, I mean, it's funny because when you said the word crisis, I have this definition of crisis, right? Mm -hmm. Which is an event or situation which threatens to overwhelm you unless the right decisions are taken. Okay. And I guess when you describe it like that, then you have to say the world is in crisis because you do sort of slightly feel that we could be overwhelmed if we, if we don't take the right decisions. And I think the, I think the short answer is that we've made over generations, we've made a lot of the wrong choices. And particularly, I know that your sort of focus and your obsession, and I think that's a good thing, is the future of the planet and the the climate. And um, I think we've got ourselves into a position where unless we take the right decisions, then there is a risk that we we all get overwhelmed. And I think there's even, even possible to say that even if we do take the right decisions, all we're going to do is minimize the damage that we are doing to ourselves. So I think it's a question of policy decisions, um, cultural decisions that we all make as individuals and as collectives and as countries and as, as a world. Um, and so, yeah, I, I'd argue that we are in, in maybe, maybe everybody says this of, of every decade, but I sort of hmm. think that we're in a worse state than we've ever been. I mean, undoubtedly so. 
apart from maybe the eons of history that we don't quite know the lived experience of, but given we are looking at billions of people being displaced um, and politics is turning towards authoritarianism to deal with it rather than implementing the science, the technology and the political tools that we have at hand. Because this is a thing you're saying, you know, we could be overwhelmed unless we take the right decisions. What do we do if the people in power um, refuse to take the right decisions, no matter the evidence? How do we wrestle power back from them? Well, you either have to influence them or you have to ask them, because the fact is that you can't, you can't do this without the people in power. Um, we can all do our own thing. We can do our bit. And lots of different people try to do that in different ways. You can organize, you can try and organize to, to influence. And again, lots of people do that in different ways, but ultimately you do have to have people who've got their hands on the absolute levers of power to, to want to go with the flow of what it is that you're trying to achieve and trying to create. And I wouldn't underestimate, although I can see why somebody like you and lives and breathes this, you, you probably feel incredibly frustrated that it's not happening quicker and that the politicians are not sort of, you know, on it the way that you would like them to be. But I wouldn't underestimate how much change has happened and how much they have sought to move. I mean, I, I can remember, I was thinking before I just started walking this morning and I was sort of thinking what we're going to talk about. And I can remember not long after Tony Blair became prime minister. And I can remember this sort of, you know, I'll be absolutely frank with you, when the kind of environmentalists were sort of trying to put us under pressure to to address some of these issues, they in a big party conference speech where, you know, they wanted to see the, hopefully to be prime minister, then leader of the opposition, Tony Blair, sort of acknowledging this as an issue. And he would, and he probably did. I mean, I can't, I'm, it's a long time since I read the early speeches, but I suspect there'd have been a, a kind of, a box would have been ticked, but that would have been about it. Hmm. Whereas I think now today, if you were to say to, Keir Starmer, who hopefully is in the same position as Tony was back then, hopefully is going to be the next prime minister and people putting him under pressure to address all sorts of different issues. But I'd be very surprised if he was making a big speech about anything that was about, you know, his vision and his plans for the future that didn't have the environment and climate right at the heart of it. You know, I pick up the, just walking by the news agents this morning, I see the front page of the Sunday Times, Starmer to ban fresh oil and gas drilling in the North Sea. Now, I don't know if it's right or wrong, but if you wouldn't have seen that back in, you know, a few years ago, even. So I think it's important when you are campaigning and trying to get change, it's really important that you kind of hold on to the progress that you have made and don't underestimate the impact of that and don't underestimate the extent to which that can become a tipping point eventually. And I think that's where you are at the moment. Now, I, I completely get why you say, well, that's not good enough. It's not fast enough and all that stuff. But I really do think, you you know, change can come, but you have to fight for it. I suppose the counter to it, though, is that, um, yes, whilst there has been a change in terms of the, the public discourse and environmental issues are front and centre in a way that they weren't 20 years ago, in a way that they were in the 80s, though. You know, Margaret Thatcher made a massive speech. Um, she was an environmentalist. She made a huge thing about how if we didn't sort of get our carbon emissions under uh, wraps that we would face a huge, huge problem. So there's been these moments in the environmental movement whereby it, it's felt close to a tipping point, especially in pol when politics kind of got the right wing on side. And then because of lobbying, because of industry, because of the press, you know, that tipping point fails to materialize. And the issue is that this crisis is exponentially worsening. Mm. So it's all very well with politics now sort of putting it front and center. Um, but at the same time, we're talking about, you know, the ice sheets collapsing, um, billions of people being displaced, not being able to feed people, collapse of energy systems. Putting the environment front and centre in your speeches and your policy doesn't really cut it, actually, you know. I get that. You know, I guess what I was trying to illustrate to you was how there has been change. There's no doubt there's been change in the debate. No doubt about that at all. What there hasn't been has been the change position for the policy solutions to be there mm -hmm. and for those to, to satisfy the people who, for whom this is a sort of, kind of existential crisis. I think the other thing that's really important to, to say though, is that, and I've, I've watched, you know, since we met last week, I watched some of your interviews with other people who are, you know, most of whom are absolutely on your side of the argument as well. And I do think it's really important when you're campaigning 
to understand that you, you've got to somehow get your own big picture inside the big picture of the other people who ultimately will have their hands on the leaders of power. So if you think about, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I don't mind admitting, I do sort of lie awake at night thinking Donald Trump's going to come back, which I think would be a disaster for the world. Now, has Joe Biden been the perfect president in relation to the climate? No. Has he done stuff that you guys probably find, you know, quite troublesome? Yes. But is he way, way, way better? Mm -hmm. the alternative, no doubt about it. You look at the way that China has, uh, and that's a very, very different democratic system. It's essentially a dictatorship, but none of this is going to be done without the Chinese coming on board. Now, how do you get uh, an authoritarian dictatorship that is seeking build and uh, a a sense of its own power in the world? How do you do that without there being at least the capacity for compromise and for for debate, the things that say to the, to the campaigners outside, this is going to take maybe longer than you think. This is not going to go at the pace that you want it to. And I think what's really important is that you don't take that as something that should make you kind of lose faith or lose sight of what you're trying to do. One of my favorite, the UK, you very kindly came to the talk in, in um, Edinburgh on, on my new book. And one of the chapters in the book is about what I call a campaign mindset, the importance of having a campaign mindset. And built into the campaign mindset has to be understanding that it's hard and that it's, you've got to keep going. And I, I say that my perfect description of, of the campaign mindset was in, I can't remember what it was, it was two or three years into our time in power. We were in Cologne at the G8 summit. That was G8, so the Russians must have still be involved. And the big thing was that we were actually, the big issue at the time was debt relief, writing off debt for some of the poorest countries in the world. Bono and Bob Gelboff were there and they were campaigning as they have done for years on that, on that particular issue. And they recognized that in the government at the time, led by Tony Blair and Gordon Brown as chancellor, that we were absolutely committed to a leadership role in trying to write off debt. And another skill is Bono and Bob, Bob Geldof was throwing a bit of a straw. He was, he was hearing the noises he was hearing weren't that we weren't going to go as far as they wanted us to. And he actually sent me a message. Um, we were meant to be seeing him and Bono and he said, we were just, there's no point. I'm not coming to the hotel. You know, fuck off. It's all Bob. I don't know, but don't be ridiculous. Come over, blah, blah, blah. So they come over and Tony, we sat down with them and Tony explained to them that This is what we've been arguing for. This is what we're trying to get, but we're not going to get there because the Germans, this and the French, this and the Italians, this and the Americans, this and the Canadians, this, and this is the lie of the land. And they were saying, well, that's not good enough. You've got to go back in there. You've got to fight harder and you've got to persuade them and blah, blah, blah. And I remember Tony said, um, this was to Bono. He said, listen, you've got to understand this is like climbing Everest, right? For some of these guys, this is like climbing Everest. And Bono said this, I'll never forget this. He said. Tony, somebody like you, if you look at Everest, you don't say that's a fucking big mountain, you fucking climb it. That's a campaign mindset and that's what you've got to have. And you've got to have it, even though you're getting, you're facing setbacks. And I think if you would, uh, Bono and Bob Geldof, if they met every single campaign, uh, goal that they sort of set out to do. No, no way have they, but has, have they seen massive progress along the way? Was that an important staging point? Yes. I understand that. And I think it is important. And I think (laughs) we could do with the dose of um, campaigning mindset at the moment, because there does seem to be this sort of uh, immense frustration amongst uh, climate campaigners around the world. Just the, the sort of this feeling of being aghast at not being listened to. But again, the counter argument is sort of like, well, It's all very well to say this is going to take time and we need to continue that progress. But when scientists are saying that we are literally threatening human civilization, we're looking at the collapse of human civilization, then there will be no politics at that point. There will be no systems with which to tinker. We are talking about a a vast, urgent change that needs to happen in the next few years. And every month that we don't, the chance of implementing those changes lessens I, dramatically. I totally get that. I get that completely. Um, and if you like, that is the argument that you have to keep pushing as hard as you can and building the support for. I'm simply saying that to, then to lodge that within the political framework, 
which is so complicated, and mm -hmm. particularly because the other thing I mentioned, China. This isn't going to be done. This isn't going to be done unless there is right across the world an understanding amongst people and amongst political leaders that this is what needs to be done. That really big changes need to happen. So you know, again, picking up on something that I was we talked about in the, on our podcast the other day. You've got a situation where. So the Germans that will look at Germany, you think, well, that's a pretty right on country. And they're kind of, you know, they're, they sort of, you know, they've now got a, gr a member of the Green Party who's their foreign minister. Uh, they've, they, they, they've had one of the longest sort of the most successful green campaigners within the campaigns within the whole body politic. And yet now that they're on to doing some of the stuff that has to be done to meet some of their targets, they're facing quite a big political backlash. and. That is, you know, if they're not careful, you're going to end up there with maybe the Greens being kind of, you know, written out of the government at the next stage. And that becomes mm. a problem. So all I'm saying is I'm not, I'm not disagreeing with what you're saying at all. I'm completely agreeing with what you're saying. I'm simply saying that to make it happen, you have to locate yourself in that real politics as opposed to, I guess you've got, what I'm saying is you've got to have the idealism. You've got to, you've got to really beat the drum for the change that's needed. And when you talk, but you've got to understand the politics and that can be very, very frustrating. I understand that. I think the other thing, to go back to your very first question about why we're in crisis, one of the reasons we're in crisis on this front is because there is this very organized and really quite dangerous right wing, particularly right wing movement that the reasons I've never understood is all, well, they want to make every single issue left, right. They want to polarize around everything. I could never understand when this debate was first really taking off in the United States, never understand because it wasn't happening here then. It wasn't happening in the UK. It is a bit now, but it wasn't back then. And you go to America and you come away thinking, how the hell has the future of the planet become a left, right? How has that happened? That if you were a kind of out and out Democrat, you believe the science, if you're an out and out Republican, they're lying to you. And that is something that goes to the, you know, the heart of the, the central theme of, of my book, really, which is about the, the extent to which populism and polarization and post-truth have come together to take some of the most serious debates in the country and fit them through that prism as opposed to a real world prism. Now, how you change that, I just don't know. I think that is a, that is the, the kind of struggle of our times. And, and I think that the, you know, I worry like. I don't quite know in relation to artificial intelligence, whether to believe those people who tell me it's going to be the same world or those people who tell me it's going to be the destroyer of the world. But what I do know is that you see it already with GPT stuff. If you are somebody trying to dislocate the truth out of the debate that you and I might want to be conducted according to people who are genuine experts, who've studied this thing in detail, who really know what they're talking about. This thing is going to help those people, I think, who actually want to dislocate the truth of the debate and to make it even further polarized into the sense of it being about, you know, they want, uh, you say you want to save the planet, but actually you're all about being, you know, woke and anti-business and anti-everything that they believe in, anti-freedom and all this sort of stuff. So these, how you depolarize. That's why the that's why the threat of a Trump return is so terrifying, frankly, because how you depolarize that debate when it's so entrenched already is very, very difficult. Based on what you see of the right wing in the United Kingdom and the United States, do you think that these people are just sort of extremist climate deniers and that they don't really understand what's going on? Um, or do you think that they understand the science, believe the science, but just believe that it won't affect them if they can harbor enough power in the interim and shore up their stocks and I don't know, whatever one will need to survive an <laughs> upcoming collapse. I honestly don't know, because when, you know, you think about them, they're human beings, they've got, most of them will have kids, they'll have grandchildren, they'll, they'll have their kids and grandchildren probably saying to them, you know, what do you like do? But I think that you know, if you go back through history, there have been various periods in history where we've got very, very wealthy and very, very well and powerful on the back of doing stuff that deep down they probably know wasn't very good for them. You know, to give you another example of a of a campaigning and, and, and the you know, what I was saying about the the campaign mindset, 
if you, if you go back, you probably won't even remember, recall the, these days, I bet. If I, I can go back to when I was a young journalist, right? I'd be sitting in our newsroom. I would reckon 70% of the people in that newsroom were smoking. And if we were out and about and I got into a taxi, I would like a cigarette. If I went into a restaurant, I would like a cigarette. And at the time, let me tell you, we would be getting bombarded. I'm now, I'm now figuring you, somebody like you, as a sort of smoking conspiracy hack. Okay. You're the, you're the, you're the smoking journalist who's trying to show the world that smoking is really, really bad for you. Now, the tobacco lobby back then was unbelievably powerful. I remember they had this MP called John Carlyle, who he was basically, you know, he was a spokesman for the tobacco industry. And Clark, who's one of the Tories that is, you know, reckoned by most people to be quite a good guy for a Tory. He was, you know, I think he was on the board of British American Tobacco. Now, so if you think how long it, for that campaign, and by the way, let me tell you, I can, this, I'm not proud to say this. We used to get all the pieces from a short the uh, action on smoking and health that was trying to persuade the world that smoking was really bad and dangerous and should be taxed high and no advertising and all that stuff, which, you know, they won on the, on, uh, effectively on a lot of the campaigns they'd done. And we used to get their press releases and people used to make a joke about it. Press, give us that. And then you, you set it on fire with a lighter and you light your fag with it because that's the sort of silly thing that people do. And so now all I'm saying to you now is like, you cannot go into a newsroom anywhere today and light up a cigarette and what's more, nobody even thinks that you should. So what I'd say about it, and you know, I, th I think that I've, I've, I often say my, one of my favorite films ever is, is, uh, have you seen the film Milk about Harvey Milk, yeah. the gay rights campaign? But the reason I love that film is because it captures without stuffing it down your throat, it captures something of the arc of campaigning. You've got no, you've got no idea within the narrative of his life, which the film starts with him being beaten up as a gay rights campaigner, and it ends with him effectively being a legislator who has managed to get the first gay rights legislation onto the American statute. Now, as it happens, he ended up being killed because he was gay. Okay. But in terms of the film of his life as a campaigner, you can't tell where the change comes. And I'd say that in the, in the debate that you're engaged in, the campaign and the fight that you're engaged in, you're somewhere along this arc, which if you're an, if you're a pessimist, that arc is going to end in total cal calamity for the entire planet. If you're an optimist, there's going to come a point where politics and technology and the desire of people to kind of stay alive combines to, to be the point at which the change comes. So there's been lots of different let there's, there's been lots of stuff that you could define as change as there was in the smoking debate. Okay. But where did the change, where did the change come in the case of gay rights, where it's, it suddenly became unacceptable to be openly and avowedly discriminating against gay people or attacking them violently, because it's not the passing of the law, passing of the law reflects that. It doesn't, the, the passing of the law doesn't create that, it reflects that. And that's why I, I always say lots of people you, that I meet, they, you know, there is so many, you know, I've got a chapter in the book about the people's vote campaign. We lost, okay. We lost that campaign. And so people will say to me, well, that was a waste of time, wasn't it? And I say, well, we lost the campaign, but it wasn't necessarily a waste of time because the fights that were at the heart of that campaign, they're going to come again. They're going to come again in some form. So the fights that you feel that you might be losing, it doesn't mean that on the bigger picture, the arc's not moving in the direction you need it to go. Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah, I think it does. I mean, I suppose the, the thing that comes to mind for me is that the people who understand this problem the most, you know, the scientists, um, are so, so many of them so despondent that they are leaving their labs and gluing themselves to banks and to streets and to gates um, because out of just desperate fear that actually we are not moving in the right direction. Um, there is perhaps, and, and I think this is because actually it's not a problem of technology, right? Like the problem isn't just, oh, we'll substitute fossil fuels for renewables. That's all we need to do. The problem, because we don't have enough minerals to have a fully renewable economy. 
Um, we need to massively reduce our energy consumption. We need to sort of reorient, you know, our economy to providing well-being. I know you interviewed Kate Rayworth recently um, for people. And so I think the fear is that the climate campaign is sort of being dominated. Anybody who is willing to talk about it is sort of being, it's being dominated by people who think, oh, well, tech will just solve the problem and that's fine then, which actually doesn't solve the bigger picture problem, which is, well, we have an extractive and exploitative uh, economy that puts billions of people in danger, is even squeezing those in the global north right now. Um, and if we continue to pretend that we can just solve this with tech, then we what we will do is waste a decade trying to implement solutions, which only continue the status quo, and at the end have lost those crucial 10 years to actually implement the changes that need to happen. So the big picture is 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 <laughs> it's very complex. I agree, but that's what I'm not I'm not I'm not I actually what I was saying there about the arc though is that it, mm. it's where the politics and people and technology combine to make the change. Mm. Um and look, it may be, it may be, and I'm sensing from some of the things you were saying that this is what you fear, it may be that even if that does happen, that we're we're kind of too late. Um but I sort of feel the one the one thing I, I kind of go up and down on this. Some days I feel utterly pessimistic about it. Other times I sort of feel, well, the world has been through all sorts of massive mm -hmm. challenges in the past, and somehow has kind of worked it out, and somehow has has got has, has, has got it to a to a better place. And I kind of feel on a, on a good day that that is going to happen. I do feel as well that a, you know the whole again. Sorry to keep plugging the book, but it's kind of what, one of the reasons. Please. Is that is that is I do actually think it's going to be your generation that does it. I think that I think that I think the change is going to come, and I think when it comes, it's going to be quicker than people think. Mm -hmm. um, and I think my point about thinking in that kind of in that arc, as opposed to you know, Christ, why can't these people see things as clearly as I see them? Uh, because that is down that road lies nothing but frustration and anger. And you've got to channel that frustration and anger in all sorts of different directions. But ultimately, you do have to win arguments within the political process in a complicated set of different countries with different agendas and different different political systems. And it's very, very, very hard to do. But I, I would say that if I identify you as a kind of campaigner on this issue, I wouldn't underestimate. I th I actually think you've made way, way more progress than, than, than you, you might feel. Good to know. <laughs> and I'm sure, I mean, people people talk about these issues. People understand the, the lexicon that's thrown about. Um, people understand often the fight. I think, um, I mean, I suppose I'm interested in how you think that this campaign can actually be won then, because it does seem to be that the the strategies that have been used up until this point were really, really effective, tw you know, back in sort of, 2019, you know, the pink boat, COVID really screwed the move and people lost momentum. Other parts of it have done well, Greta Thunberg. So like the, the raising the alarm has gone very well. And now what it seems is that um, in order to get more of a critical mass, critical mass behind it, there needs to be some answers. Like, well, this is what we propose. This is what we would like to implement. And obviously Extinction Rebellion's ideas has said, well, we want a citizens' assembly because it has to be a deliberatively democratic process. That's a pretty difficult drum to bang, in my opinion, when you see an increasingly precarious society in which the cost of living is, you know, affecting people's physical health, mental health, emotional health, community health, everything. People want some certainty. And we know when a society starts to break down, that's typically when big daddy governments enter in authoritarianism. So what, in your opinion, can the climate campaign do now to kind of update its OS, its operating system, and become more effective? What is the next step for it? How, do, how does it engage with the real politic? Well, when you say it, it is a collection of lots of different people and lots of different organizations. And so you, you, like you mentioned Greta Thunberg there. I think that she has made a huge difference in terms of the debate and in terms of raising awareness. And yet, funny enough, I was, and by the way, I think she's great. I'm not denigrating at all, but I was in school the other day and I was talking to these kids about 15, 16, and it was really interesting talking to them because they were like, it was almost like, well, she's last generation. And oh, well. I was intrigued by that. I was saying, hold on a minute. So Chris, no, they said, no, she's pretty cool and she's good, but you know, she's not kind of, she's not us. And they were looking for 
people even younger to kind of come along. And I think that that's, so it's really important to, when you say, what does the movement do? The, the whole point of a movement is that it's a movement made up of lots of different organizations and individuals doing different things. So you take like, you know, yesterday, I, I, I have, I have some difficulty with some of the tactics that you used. Um, you mentioned earlier scientists, you know, uh, gluing themselves and, and chaining themselves to buildings and so forth. And that kind of protest has always had a role in, in trying to make change. You yesterday, the rugby cup final and the, the, uh, stop the oil people were onto the pitch and throwing that orange stuff around as they've been doing at the Chelsea flower show and other, and other places. And, you know, it's, it's getting the balance right between protests to make a point and also losing some of the support of some of the public opinion that you might feel that you need to take with you. And that's, a, that's a tricky area, but I think you, so you said that you'd met some of your objectives and some of the strategy that you've deployed in the past. For me, the single most important thing is actually that you, you have clarity about what that objective is and that you then try to have clarity around the strategy and the biggest, most powerful voices within the movement are the ones that can best encapsulate that. Um, so I guess I would say, I think, I think you maybe need a more, co a more coordinated sense of what it is that you're trying to achieve. I probably would still want to see it all rooted in the science. I think one of the ways we have to de defeat this populism, polarization, post truth thing is actually to rewin the argument for facts to be at the heart of debate. And that may be a completely separate campaign. It may, you may reach a point. You know, we haven't mentioned Al Gore, but I think Al, Al Gore's film, An Inconvenient Truth, um, which w was a brilliant piece of educative polemic, if you like. Um, but that case has to be made again and again and again and again. And I think sometimes what's happened is when you were on the inside of a, of a campaign, you kind of feel, because you know it so well and you feel it so deeply, that kind of the public have got it as well. And most of the people around most parts of the world, they just haven't. So I, I think actually you say you feel like you lost a bit of momentum. I think you've lost the momentum in part because you've stopped telling the basic story and you've stopped maybe campaigning on some of those fundamentals. Here's the thing, you know, just if you're a campaigner or if you're a communicator, at the point when you are sick to death of hearing your voice saying the same thing again and again and again and again and again. That is the point in my experience when it's just about beginning to penetrate the outside radar of a point that you need to be getting into the body politic. Um, so I guess what I would say, when you say what advice would I have to for, for the, the movement as a whole, it would actually a little bit to be go back, to, go back to basics. Um, because there's so much, this is the, if you were to go back tonight and watch that inconvenient truth film, right? I bet you find loads of stuff there worth campaigning on now. This that actually isn't at the heart of this debate. I would I would repackage the when I say repackage, I, I'd, I'd delve, go back into the science, and find ways of making that more, I guess more scary. I guess more. I think you've got to you know part of what you've got to do is to, is to sort of shape people's complacency. We are unbelievably complacent about everything. So I don't know if that makes sense, but I think it's, I think sometimes in any campaign, people move off the basic stuff far too quickly because they get bored with it. They get very frustrated. They get very angry and they keep thinking they have to create new things to say. You don't often have to create new things to say. You have to find new ways of saying them. How do we, how do we get people like you to join the campaign? Because there's this binary right in this conversation, me as a climate campaigner and you. Um, and so why, why are you, you agree with the science? You uh, have your days of pessimism and optimism. Why aren't you with us <laughs> vocally every day on this? Um, because I'm, because I'm vocally doing lots of stuff. <laughs> um, I actually think I'm part of, uh, I'm, look, partly it's because it's, it's, I'll tell you a story actually, Georgia Gould, who's the daughter of my best friend, Philip, 
who died a few years ago. And I, so I, I'd done what I'd done in government and worked in government for, you know, 10 years, whatever it was. And then I come out and I'm kind of, I'm kind of struggling to find out what's the point of my life and different things. And I remember she came and at G Georgia, Philip's daughter came around and she, she had this pile of books. Uh, the one that I remember vividly was The Uninhabitable Earth. And I read it and her point was to say to me, this is your cause now. This is your cause. This is what you've got to do. Your skills and your experience, this is what you get into. And it definitely moved like, the dial inside me big time. I read that book and I read several others. It's when I became obsessed with trees and, you know, and then they also read all that. Now, the point is at that time, I had already decided, I'd written a novel about mental health and I decided I was going to campaign to try to move the dial on our understanding and awareness of mental health and the view to try to more money for service. And that was kind of, I guess I definitely got the dial moved and we definitely got more money and we definitely got more awareness. I still feel we're not in the place that we need to be. Now you would say, well, that's all very well talking about a campaign on mental health, but we don't save the planet. You know, none of that matters a damn because we're all going to have trouble mental health. And indeed there's such a thing as climate anxiety. Now I completely get that. But I guess I don't want to do anything full time anymore. That's just a personal choice for me. Um, something may come that I feel I want to do that, but at the moment I don't want that. And I feel that, you know, why am I talking to you? Because I bumped into you at an event that I did and you told me about yourself and what you did. And I thought, yeah, that sounds interesting. I'd like to do that. Now, hopefully somebody will watch this who will think, well, yeah, that's interesting. I might get involved in that. You know, so I think we can all do it in different ways. Um, and I would say on the podcast, we talk about, we probably don't talk about climate enough, but we definitely talk about this being the sort of, you know, the single most pressing issue that governments of the world have got to face up to and, and tackle. So listen, and also this is, this is why it's so important that people you do, like you do what you do is because, you know, I, you, you, I probably will get more involved now as a result of, you know, talking to you and you sort of prodding me and, um, you know, and, and, and making me feel that, that I should. Um, so I, you know, I wouldn't, anyway, that's a long winded way of saying, I don't know. <laughs> Good. Because listen, to be completely frank with you, Alistair, I've obviously I've been thinking about this interview since last week and I was like, right, what's the main thing that I want to get out of this? I would love to get you involved more explicitly in some way. Feeling, uh, I don't know, a sense of, God, this might sound awful, but feeling a sense of responsibility. Um, your platform is incredible. Your skills are incredible. The problem that uh, bits of the movement faces is like a lack of legitimacy almost because you're trying to explain, you're trying to explain science in a world where science is denigrated and you're trying to explain the, the impact that they would have on the real world and that completely uh, counteracts the narrative that we are fed about how everything works and nobody seems to want to put the pieces together and nobody in charge really seems to be taking it as seriously as these hippies on the street. So, you know, what's the real problem? And it's like, well, the hippies on the street are the ones, they, they, they really get it. They really, really, really get it. And that's not to say that there are people in power who don't get it, but whatever it withholds them from implementing what the hippies on the street are asking for, and I'm one of those hippies on the street, I suppose, as well, um, it's a huge problem. And like people like you, the legitimacy that you bring to debate because of your history, it's a huge impact. Yeah, I think it would really help. Yeah, hold on, Rachel. You, you might find that some of those hippies on the street, um, your phrase, not mine. If, yep. I, if I were to suddenly pitch up with a house to them and start saying, well, this is what you need to do, but they had to come along. This guy who quotes, you know, gave us the Iraq war and his way around the world for Tony Blair and blah, blah, blah. So, you, you know, I, I've got enough self-awareness to know that that's not a kind of, I'm very, that's as of you to say that, that that's your assessment of me. And I, I would think, you know, I do have skills that I could bring to this, this debate and I try to do that. But I think that, you know, I guess that maybe the, the, the other thing is how do you, how do you build that coalition that, mm -hmm. that makes the, the image of you like of the movement that you were talking about and that you, you care so much about, how do you make it less people feeling that this is about the hippies on the street as opposed to this is like everybody's future? Yes. Right. Now, I think that's something that maybe I could help, probably could help 
you know, build education around that and campaigning around that. But I think I'd probably do it better by talking to people like you and, and suggesting to you as to how it might be done. Well, I think that's um, just as legitimate and important yeah. sort of a tactic. Like, you know, when we, we're talking about the movement, and maybe I've been sort of wrong to use that phrase. It's a phrase I use, a term I use a lot, and I actually don't know what it means. But certainly when I think of the action that needs to be taken, I think of an ecosystem. So there's the visible part, and that tends to be the quote-unquote hippies on the street. And my poor mates are listening to this. <laughs> my poor hippie mates are listening to this going, why is she, why is she using this term? What is she doing, idiot? But that's the visible part. But then there's lots of other people who are working, you know, who are trying to get closer to power, who are working on narrative strategies, who are trying to implement policies, people who are trying to like tweak with the press. So it is an ecosystem of action. Things we do need a kind of, yeah, I think we need a, a better generalized campaign strategy. When you look at campaigns that are effective, it's not that all of the action has to be homogenous, but the reason behind it or the messaging behind it has to be consistent. Yeah. Um, and, it has, and it has, to go back to the point I made earlier, it has to be messaging that speaks to a much wider audience than those who are already with you. That's my point. I mean, the, the danger of the kind of hippie on the street approach is that you want to be, and by the way, I think the British public, if we talk about the UK, maybe less so in America, uh, but, and, and I think around Europe, pretty similar to us, I think you can get a very broad um, spread of support for the basic message that you're trying to, trying to attract, but try, trying to put out there. But I think you do a better job at that if you aim those messages broadly, as opposed to in other people who are already converted and are already on your side. And I think, by the way, to go back to the point about how you might campaign from this on now on in, I do think this thing about constantly revisiting the science, never thinking that anything is old news. Um, there's so much stuff in it. I mean, I, I remember reading that book, uh, The Other Happy of Earth. I mean, there, there are just so many things that, that, you know, I follow this stuff reasonably closely. I read quite widely, but there's so much stuff in there that I felt like I was learning something for the first time. Now, I've already forgotten it. I've already forgotten it. How do you make, if you, if I, let me, get, let me just suggest this to you. If you were only allowed to communicate one fact to somebody you're trying to persuade your cause, what would it be? A fact. Yeah, I'm not big on facts. Um, <laughs> big on stories. Would it be to do with the temperature? Would it to do, well, it might be the story. It might be, a, it might be a, a rooted in stories of the number of people who've been affected by I don't know, but so it would be something for me. It'd be something to do with the unfairness and inequity, because to me, this is where the campaign needs to move. Because you have to join up the environmental campaign and labour campaigns around the world, um, and to me, like the roots of the crisis are in inequity and inequality. Essentially, if you have a fair world, you don't have a planet on fire. Um, so to me, that's where it needs to go, and to me, that's very, what makes sense. Very. That's a much, much bigger landscape that you're going on. Um, maybe that's the right thing, but I, I, I just think that you need to, maybe not one fab, but I, I would go away and reread all the science about how do I make this stuff come alive for people around the world rooted in three, five, or 10 facts. Um, you know, we, you mentioned the interview we did with, with Kelly Raywood, and funny enough, Rory Stewart and I were, we were talking about it this morning. Um, because when we, the interview is going out in a couple of weeks and we always have a sort of discussion after it. And we, at the time we did the interview, we were both in a rush and we didn't have time. And so we did it today and we, we admitted, and, and I suspect I'll feel the same after talking to you today, we admitted that we both felt like the sort of, the kind of old stages who kept thinking, oh, well, it's a great idea, but I'm not sure it's realistic. And yeah, it's a great idea, but it's a bit idealistic because that's not how politics works. And we were, she was giving us this kind of passion and, intellect and idealism about a different way of thinking about how we live our lives. And we were sort of saying, yeah, well, that's not going to go down well with people here and there and everywhere. So, and likewise with you, you're saying, this is what the world needs to do now. And I'm trying, I'm giving you reasons as to why that's just unrealistic because of the nature of politics and human nature and so forth. And so I think you've got to, you've got to build the, the messaging about this that connects with these people outside your own 
your own band where you're all kind of feeling it deep. You've got to be messaging outside that. And that's why I sometimes I, I understand that I think there is a value in these protests that go on, but there's also a little price to be paid on that front. You know, there are people on this just outside your band who are probably pushing away every time that happens. Now you can get them back, but they need to know. So I, one of the most impressive things that happened yesterday was the, the, this was the thing of the Twickenham at the rugby, where I just saw, it wasn't actually that big on the news, but it was a little bit. And I saw a clip of one of the people who was involved in the protest. It was a GP. Okay. And he said, I'm a GP and basically it's already happening, but we are creating a health crisis that we're having to deal with. And, the, and I just thought, you know, for some reason that kind of connected with me in a way that it probably wouldn't have done if it had been a hippie on the street. Now, I don't know if that was deliberate. You know, you think about Twickenham, rugby, middle class, you think about GP, middle class. And I just think there's a piece of campaign messaging that worked. Now, what the hell will happen to him? God only knows. Will, will somebody decide actually, you know, he's got to get struck off for it? I don't know. But so I think it's just about being, being clever about how you campaign and about having and not underestimating the the wealth of factual evidence that you have at your disposal. And here's another thing. Every time you spell it out, do it like you're doing it for the first time in your life. You know, you know it all too well, but you know, you, your, your job has got to be persuading people to come to your cause, persuading them to pressure politicians, persuading the politicians to take it more seriously. And. I think we sometimes underestimate the agency that we do have because we see so often how that agency isn't exercised and doesn't succeed. But just because it doesn't succeed every time doesn't mean that it can't succeed where it really matters. Do you think that the relationship of agency between populace and politics is changing? I mean, if we think about, you know, how the last three Tory governments have managed to get away with outright lying to the public, yeah. haven't been held accountable for it, Donald Trump as well, this sort of post-truth world, um, the increasingly evident relationships between industry and politics and lobbying. Um, when you sort of combine all of these factors together, like the agency of the populace seems to be diminishing every day as wealth doesn't trickle but floods up to the top. No, I, I, I totally get why you say that. And it's, that, that is incredibly frustrating. Um, all I'd say, looking slightly on the bright side, is <laughs> Trump was kicked out. He may come back. He thinks he can come back. He shouldn't even be allowed anywhere near it, but he does. So, that's, so he's gone. Bolsonaro in Brazil. Bolsonaro, you know, don't underestimate how much damage he did. Literally in relation to his policies on the Amazon, but also just the fact of that be at a time when I, I, you said how COVID set things back, I would argue that set things back, but he's gone. He's been kicked out. Johnson's been kicked out. Um, so, you know, the, the, the populace, I mean, when you said whether the populace has less, but I thought you, I thought you meant the populist, um, <laughs> but, the, but so people do have power. Um, but it just, I think the problem is that people think in democracies that the only time they have the right to exercise that power is in elections. And let's be frank, in most electoral systems, a lot of people will vote and it, you know, in terms of changing the, the, the makeup of their constituency, it will have, it can have very little effect. But the truth is what I'm talking about is people are underestimating their power between the elections to make things happen, to influence MPs. Um, to influence legislators and so forth, and to influence you, you know, we haven't really talked much about the media, but I think it is a huge problem that, that the within our media this debate has come pretty, come pretty polarized. Um, you know, the, the it's not that the right wing media sort of are ranching out climate deniers. It's and sorry, just to interrupt, but there was um, an updated study done to um, that looked at the the scientific consensus that climate change is anthropogenic, that it is man-made. There was a study done analysing uh, the media across five Anglophone countries, including uh, the United Kingdom, um, to see if that consensus, which is a really low bar, yeah, yeah. that climate change is man-made or a man-made problem, 
Um, and in our elite right wing press, even something like The Telegraph, which sort of positions itself as like a brother, you know, of the times, 70% accuracy on that. Wow. And that study was updated last year. Wow. No, I, I, what the point I was going to make is I'm mm. the, and listen, I take that on board. And, and my point is that, that I was going to make is actually it's the, it's the downplaying of it as an actual issue within the bigger political debate. That's where I think there's, whereas you go to America and you literally see outright climate change denial with certain columnists, and then there'll be other columnists right on the other side of the debate and that center ground, you know, gets somewhat lost. But I do think all this can change. I do. And, and, you know, I, I think you understand why it's incredibly frustrating if you sort of live and breathe it every day, but the pe people in the end, I think this, look, we either change for the better or we change for the worse and it change for the worse on this debate. And I, as I say, I would link it to the whole thing about populism and polarization. That has to be challenged and defeated. But if we, if we go yet, yeah, if we take further steps in a worse direction, then, you know, the alarm, the alarm bells aren't just ringing. They're kind of, you know, they're deafening and we're, we're done for. And I guess that's where on a bad day you feel you are. And you you look at the way that politics is and you think that's where politics is taking us. I'm simply saying if enough people get engaged and enough people get involved, don't underestimate the power and the agency that we all have as individuals and as, you know, obviously we work together with other people. I'm up for helping, Rachel. <laughs> Oh, great. I'm glad I've got that uh, on camera. Yeah. <laughs> and what's more, you know, contrary to mythology, uh, if I say I'm going to do something, I'll do it. But I'd, I'd, I'd have to sit down very carefully with you and think through what that would be. Um, Let's do that. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. All right. Well, now that I've got my objective met, <laughs> I've got one final question for you. Who would you like to platform? What about Ed Miliband? Great. There you go. Wonderful. Okay. Also, thank you so much for your time. <laughs> if you want to learn more, I've put links to everything in the description box below. Remember to subscribe to the channel if you're new here and share the episode if you enjoyed it. To support the show, subscribe at planetcritical.com where you can read the weekly newsletter inspired by each interview. You can also become a Planet Critical patron. All links are in the description box below. As always, my deepest thanks to that community. Planet Critical wouldn't exist without your support. Thank you everyone for listening and for coming on this journey together.